everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Design to Move. My name is Ryan Maxwell, and this is Addie. She's gonna be our backup today. I'm a movement specialist here with Fluid Health and Fitness, and every week we bring you a new topic on a movement distortion or a muscular imbalance, where we see this in the general population. This week is gonna be on bulging disc, rounded spine, and altered breathing mechanics. A lot to go over, so we're gonna be very quick here. And we do have a table of contents to the side if you wanna to skip to any one of those segments and then a condensed version of what you're hearing today at the bottom so you can go right to it if you just wanna follow along with the clinic. If you have questions on this topic, you can reach out to us at admin at fluidhealthandfitness.com. We also write a blog on the topic which is gonna be listed in the, the description below. If you do like what you're hearing, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Now recall again that this is not serving as a substitution for medical advice. If you are in pain, if you have cause for concern, make sure to talk to your physician. And if you do anything that provokes pain, stop. So we want to work within a functional range of motion that does not, again, provoke pain. Okay, before we get into the release, we want to give you a quick background on the basics of the anatomy and the movement of the hips. What we want to acknowledge first off is that there is a muscle that connects your femur to your pelvis in the front of your spine called the psoas muscle. This muscle is a hip flexor, so as you see Addie, she's drawing her leg up in the air. Flexing the muscle, it draws the leg up towards her torso. Now, the muscles have a tendency to be tight because we sit for long periods of time, we wear heels, we have things that push our weight forward, and because of which we over-engage these muscles. The functional issue is that when these muscles get tight, they pull the pelvis downward towards the floor, arching, creating an excess of arch in the lower spine. Because remember, they attach the femur to the front of the spine. Now, the problem with that is that it tips the hips forward and it opens up the thoracic. So the ribs will start to lift up and you'll go into hyperextension through the lower back. Now, as that goes on, the body recognizes that that's not appropriate. So it doesn't like all that pressure on the back. So it shifts its hips forward and we start stacking our weight forward like so. Now, once again, we see that in all these populations. Go to the mall once in a while. You'll see that with a lot of people that starts to shift the weight of your body into the flexors, the ligaments of the hip, the front hip ligaments, and also stacks the vertebrae, putting a lot of pressure on the discs of the spine. Remember, the discs are the little ligaments that basically uh, separate the discs of your vertebrae, right? Now again, this can put a lot of pressure on them over the course of time and eventually lead to a breakdown and a degeneration of those discs, which is either going to show up as a bulging, meaning that the disc slides out past its natural home and then starts to impinge on the nerve ending, or it'll actually rupture and actually push out and spread out. The center of the disc actually squirts out through the outer ridge and then impinges into the nerve ending and that's where a lot of pain happens and you end up meeting with your surgeon. So the goal here today is to recognize that there is a gross biomechanical consideration that we need to be aware of so that we can alter the natural posture of our body to restore the natural efficient biomechanics that will help to reduce the symptoms in the spine. And there's a few things that we can do. One, reduce the, the hip flexor, the psoas and then activate and strengthen the muscles that hold the pelvis under the transverse abdominis, the deepest layer of our abdominal wall, and then integrate breathing techniques once we've shorn up or tightened up our corset, which is basically that transverse abdominis, getting the body to use its respiratory mechanics to open up the discs and take the pressure off the spine itself. And all of this we're gonna do today with different techniques and we're gonna show you how. So what we are gonna need is a lacrosse ball. This is your run of the mill little cross ball. And Addie's gonna show you how to get in to the hip flexor. So we're gonna get around the table. You guys can join us, let's get started. So the psoas muscle, again, is that hip flexor. It, it shortens and pulls the leg up and it lays deep into the hip underneath a lot of superficial muscles from the quads. So in order for us to get into it, we need a little ball that's gonna have a little apex to push into the hip. So you see with Addie, she's got the ball right underneath her hip bone and then pushed into that little recess or groove of her pelvis. Now while she's on top of it, she's gonna draw her arms back to kind of reduce the pressure on her lower back. Again, if we're dealing with disc issues, that could aggravate it. So we wanna put the body as neutral as possible, stacking the spine so that it's nice and symmetrical. So she's gonna tuck her chin, keep her head 
tucked down, so tuck your chin down, there you go, Eddie. And she's gonna keep her legs directly under her. Now, she's gonna shift her weight gently into her left hip so that she puts more pressure onto that ball. The ball is basically pushing into the psoas muscle. The pressure of that is going to start to tug on its connective points or its tendons, and that's gonna help to turn off the, ten or the, the tenacity or the tension of the muscle. This, again, is a static release and we can make it an active release by going in and starting to move through the pelvis. So with the ball under the hip, with the pressure on the flexors, she's gonna to start to breathe out and tuck her tailbone under just a little bit. By doing that, it's gonna push the hip deeper into that ball and actually, in essence, stretch the psoas as it pulls under. Now, we know that, again, if it's tight, it's going to have all sorts of impact on her pelvis, so she's going to try to keep it as stable as possible, not really moving so much through her hips, or she could actually bend through the knee, breathe out, and stretch through the rectus femoris and the quadricep muscles, and that will help to pull the pelvis under as well if she breathes out as she bends the knee. So all the while, we would be applying the pressure on the ball. It should be fairly significant because again, it's a tough, little, rigid little muscle underneath all of that other superficial muscle. So put some consistent weight into it. You would hold it there for about 60 seconds and we would wanna do both sides of the body. Remember one more time, these muscles pull the hips downward, creating extra extension and pressure into the lower back. The releasing of these muscles will help to restore the natural pelvic alignment so that the hips can tuck back under and we can regain our natural biomechanical um, positioning. So on that, we're done with the release. We're going to get into a stretch. Let's get started. So once we've completed our soft tissue release using the lacrosse ball, we're going to go into a stretch. Now Addie's positioned so that the leg that we were just working on is underneath of her. This is the affected or braced leg. The main takeaway here is that we stack our spine so that we're in a neutral alignment. The tip of her AC joint is right over her trochanter, right over her knee. A lot of times you'll see individuals that do this stretch, but they do it in a way that's actually gonna compromise the spine. And as we're trying to protect the spine today, we don't wanna do what I'm gonna show you right now. So remember, this is the wrong way to do it. So if it's too tight on her flexors and her psoas, if she goes into stretch by pulling her weight forward, her back's gonna extend and pull her hips downward. So she's gonna anchor her pelvis, go ahead and come back up, by flexing her butt and rotating her tailbone under. That's gonna to help to maintain the stability of her lumbopelvic system. And she's doing that by engaging her abs on that side. She's crunching down, flexing her glute, and breathing out actively. That's going to create spinal flexion through the lumbar. Now once that's set and isolated, she's gonna then, and only then, contralaterally tilt to the opposite side, and then flex through the opposite knee. And that's gonna pull the pelvis under, creating a deeper stretch on the opposite hemisphere. Okay, so come back up. Now as she does this, she's gonna go through this in waves. She's gonna breathe out, flex her glute, contralaterally tilt, and gently ease into the stretch through the flexion in the opposite knee. Each time she does this, she's seeking a greater and greater range of motion out of her hip, but not at the sake of sacrificing her lower back. So if she goes too far, and once again starts to extend the lower back, she's gone too far, and you know that again, she's moving the joints and not actually stretching the muscle. So we wanna ask permission of the muscle by going through this passive stretch technique so that the sensory receptors of those tissues start to let go and it allows us to get deeper and deeper and longer and longer into that range of motion. And again, that's gonna to help to restore the natural positioning of the pelvis so that we can take advantage of the next exercise. So remember, you're gonna do about 60 seconds to two minutes of stretching on both sides of the body before we would get into the next exercise. Let's hit it. So recall that the psoas once again pulls the pelvis down, creates compression into the back that over the course of time compresses the discs between the vertebrae, it dries them out, it dehydrates them, and then when we go into flexion, because they're getting compressed from the backside, when we go into flexion, we're actually creating a change in the pressure gradient on the disc, which then exerts a force backwards. And that's how the disc can actually start to squirt 
out or again translate back towards the spinal column or into the canal where the nerve endings flow through and that's how we start to feel pain. Now recall a lot of people have the bulging discs but they experience no pain. So again this can be a phantom issue that provokes itself decades later before you would ever know that there was a bulging disc and then you go into a quick flexion or rotation movement and all of a sudden that pops. So the point today is to recognize that the postures of our natural mechanics can lead to these distortions and we want to get ahead of it before it happens. One of the major things that you can do to help restore the length of your spine and the positioning of your pelvis is to engage the deepest abdominal musculature called the transverse abdominis. And we're going to show you how to do that today. Addie's on the table. She's going to lay so that her knees are bent at about 90 degrees. She's centering her spine again. So what she's going to do first is make sure that her lower back is imprinted into the mat. So again, she's going to squeeze this little roller. She's got a foam roller between her legs. It's going to set the natural orientation of her femurs in the hip sockets. She's going to plant her heels down and gently pull them back towards her hips. So she's not physically moving the foot. She's just using traction, engaging her hamstrings. That's going to help to stabilize her pelvis as well. Once all of this is done, she's going to gently lift her torso off the table keeping her head basically braced in between her fingertips and her elbows are out to the side so she can't see them through her peripheral. Now that's going to keep again the shoulder joint stable, the neck stable, and primarily the muscle that's actually lifting her torso up are her abdominals and again the transverse abdominis. Now if we want to make this a challenge, and we always want to make it a challenge, we're going to make her breathe and start these breathing mechanics. Well, make sure that you guys understand as you breathe out, you engage your active respiratory muscles and these are your abdominals. So she's going to breathe out deeply, get all the air out of her lungs, feel that nice tension relationship around her midsection and then breathe in without letting her body come back down. So we're going to hold this position isometrically for upwards of two minutes. Okay. Now we're not going to hold her today and for you folks at home, this may be a challenge, especially if you've never done anything like this before. You might want to break it up into segments. If you notice that your body starts to distort, so the arms start to come up, right, or the neck starts to crane forward, or your head kicks back, possibly the hips start to shift one side or the other, you're unable to continue with the breathing mechanics, these are all indications, again, that you may want to recover give yourself a little bit of time to chill out, get back into the position, and try to accumulate upwards of two minutes for two sets. So that's a total of four minutes of time under tension, isometrically holding this transverse abdominis position while breathing in through the nose and then out through the mouth. And ideally, you would take in two seconds of breath in through the nose, four seconds out through the mouth, and again, help to maintain the abdominal pressure. Okay, so go ahead and chill out for a bit. So again, after you've done one set of that, up to two minutes, give yourself about 45 seconds to a minute to recover, and then you would do another set, and then that would bring us to the end of the activation. Once again, the goal is to facilitate or upregulate the use of that deepest transverse abdominis, abdominal muscle to hold the ribs down and keep the pelvis under so that the center of mass is oriented as it should be right over your baselines. Now that we have that going on, then we want to actively engage the muscles that are going to help to orient our pelvis. Oftentimes we have one hip drop to the side, so we want to take out that element of these flawed biomechanics and we're going to do just that again with the next movement. So let's get started. Now that we've activated your deep corset, now we want to go and put the newfound rhythm of your nervous system into a functional movement and this is going to be an integration uh, exercise. So we want to recognize a couple things. During gait or while we're walking, we have a tendency to offset our hip to the side because we don't have strong enough glutes and so our hips will shift off and our knee will rotate in. That's called a valgus collapse of the knee. Now, if you could see from behind, her hip is dropping down and it's creating, again, pressure on the spine, bowing the spine to the opposite direction. So her hip will drop out and her rib cage will roll to the other side. So that's gonna create a bowing in the spine. Now, if we have excessive flexion or extension, so extension or flexion, and then we have the drop in the curve, 
that puts a lot of apex tension on the discs of the vertebrae and that can wear them out prematurely aggravating these bulging discs and issues that we're trying to um, avoid. So we're going to try to get the hips to be centered. Now, normally because of the right motor dominance in our bodies, we have a tendency to see more of this on the right side. Today we're going to demonstrate the right side. You're welcome to do both sides, but again, big recommendation here for 95% of the population, we would want to focus on that right side because that's normally our dominant player hemispherically. Okay, so we're going to show you the right side. So again, She's gonna practice flexing the muscle on the side of her butt called the glute medius, and then shortening up the muscles that attach her ribs to her pelvis, the obliques and the QL muscles on the back side of the, of the pelvis, or attaching the pelvis to the rib cage. So she's gonna hike the hip up on the left, lock her knee out on the right, and pull her pelvis up, flexing the glute and the oblique on the opposite hemisphere all at once. We're gonna try to coordinate that position. Okay, now that's the movement profile. Now she's gonna add the additional load by adding this band. So you'll notice that she's gonna lace her feet through the, the lasso, or lasso or her hips. She's gonna place it right at about her trochanter. So it's a little bit lower. The trochanter is the basically the elbow of where the femur meets up with the shaft of her hip. And then the nature of the band is gonna pull her hip over. So real quick, before you move anywhere, Eddie, sh show them how it works. It's gonna pull her hip towards the wall. So when she comes out of this, she's gonna push her heel down and push her hip back the other way. And by doing that, that's gonna work the abductors and lateral rotators of her hip. And again, the one that we're really working on, the glute medius, okay? So she's gonna step forward about six inches from where it's attached to the wall. If you guys have a band at home, go ahead and set it up. You can wrap it around a doorknob. If you need a band, we sell them on our website, so check it out there. But either way, she's gonna start in that upright position. So she's gonna step back, shift her weight to the side, make sure that her pelvis doesn't rotate outward so the hip line is still neutral. Then she's gonna push through her heel, lock her knee out on the right, and lift her left hip up. And then slowly come down to a count of four. So she's gonna come down for four, three, two, translate to the side, and then lift up, push up, push through the heel, straighten the knee and lift the hip to the opposite direction and then come on down. So she's gonna go again down for her four count, pause at the bottom for two, let her hip shift out, hike the hip that we're trying to work and then come up to hip extension and hike the opposite hemisphere. This is a, an example of an exercise that's going to attack the lateral sling system of the body it's a set of muscles that help to maintain the lateral positioning of the pelvis. And again, if we recognize that the pelvis is where your spine fits into, if it shifts off to the side, it's gonna compress the spine because that's gonna roll with it. Obviously, that's gonna impact the way that the spinal column or segments attach. And if we add in the flexion or extension dominance, this can make a pretty quick uh, job of destroying our discs. Okay, so again, the goal here is to be able to work through the musculature that's gonna help to restore that functional positioning, and you're gonna wanna do it nice and slow. Precision is key on this. On the back end of that lunge, what we're gonna avoid is the outsweep of the hip, so the pelvis isn't gonna roll open. We'll see that again as a valgus collapse in the knee. We would wanna watch out for the foot rotating outward or everting. We would wanna make sure that the spine doesn't bow in deflection or hyperextension. And we're gonna try our best to keep our center of mass over our pelvis the entire time. It is a challenge when you first get started, when you come up to that balance point, so you might take a couple times, or it might take a couple sessions to get the hang of it, but if you attack it, keep after it, you'll notice that it gets easier and easier, and your hips are gonna get stronger and stronger and you're gonna feel a whole lot better through your spine. So again, we're gonna do two sets of 20 repetitions. Remember, it's a four second down, two at the bottom, one to two seconds up, all said and done. It's gonna be about two minutes per set, and give yourself about a minute in between just to recover, and then we're gonna finish off with our last strength movement. We're just gonna incorporate again that transverse abdominis and now more focus on the breathing mechanics, so let's get to it. The less strength exercise is gonna be incorporating our diaphragm and that transverse abdominis that we targeted at the outset of the program. What we wanna recognize is that the placement of the rib cage has everything to do with how your body's going to breathe. So if I have my ribs ascended like so, or again, concave back, 
the way that my diaphragm, which is my primary respiratory muscle, it's a dome inside the ribs that when it contracts, it comes down and it sucks air into your, uh, your lungs. Now recall that if the position of the rib cage is misaligned, I'm not gonna get the same type of engagement. Now that's very important for spinal health as the mechanics of that diaphragm actually opens the ribs up and it pulls the facet joints that the ribs attach to open thereby providing circulation and blood flow back to the discs. So once again, hypermobility around the discs without adequate nutrient delivery because of, again, restriction for blood flow and circulation has a lot to do with the ability of the disc to remain healthy and keep it from being compromised and bulging. So it's very important that we learn these mechanics so that we can restore the function of those column or your spinal column in the discs. So to do that, she's gonna get on all four. Her hands are gonna be directly under her shoulders. Her knees are under her hips. You'll notice that her knees are within her hip line. So they're not wide. Her knees aren't wide and her feet aren't stacking together. So they're on top of each other. Now she's gonna breathe in. As she breathes in, she's gonna expand her back. So she's in a domed position. Her abdominals are engaged. And so as she breathes in, the air has to go back through her posterior lateral side of her rib cage. So she's gonna feel a natural extension or a lengthening of the muscles along the back of her body. By letting her head tuck down just a little bit, that'll actually emphasize it. Now at the apex of that breath, she's gonna breathe out deeply and slowly let her back come down into a natural arch. Now if she's in a rounded position and she has actually created a bulging disc, the act of rounding will feel good. It's gonna take some of the pressure off, okay? Now if she goes down and goes into an extension, that might aggravate it. Or inversely, it might actually aggravate it if she rounds too much. So as she shifts her weight, her spinal column shifts forward, it might actually push on the disc and make it extrude towards the backside and that might aggravate the nerve. So one more time, recall that we are trying to move within a pain-free range of motion, one that you can control and make sure that it's precise with intention. Don't just go through the motion just to go through the motion and whatever you do, if it provokes pain, don't do it at all. So again, she's gonna breathe within her natural range of motion, expand as much as she can, push her palms down into the ground, dome through the thoracic, open up the facet joints, breathe out and slowly come down, controlling it with her abdominals, which is gonna allow her to co-contract the backside musculature and the front side musculature that supports the spine all together, allowing her better body awareness and more, again, lumbar pelvic hip stability. So again, we would breathe in for four, or rather two, Breathe in and get as much air as you possibly can into the hips or into the lungs and then breathe out to a count of four. Slow breath out, force the air out with your abdominals and come back to a natural alignment. Okay, great job, Betty. So we would do this again for about 20 repetitions. Again, we would normally call this a cat cow. There's all sorts of colloquialisms in yoga and different movement practices. But really what we're looking at is restoring the function and the natural fluidity or mechanics of the spine. Also, we want to teach the body how to engage both sets of muscles on the front and the back side of the spine so it can unload the column and create enough, again, muscular strength to support um, the function that we need without compromising the discs. So again, this brings us to the end of our segment. We went through a lot of stuff today. We do need to recognize that the attachment points of the psoas and the hip flexors will alter the mechanics of the pelvis. We normally shift our pelvis forward or our posture forward, which creates a tendency for us to go into excess flexion in the spine. So what we're trying to do is restore, again, the natural posture relationship of the spine, make sure that the muscles that are tasked to do that know how to cooperate, and then, again, feed that into your day-to-day -day activities so that your body can remember this so you don't have to worry about it blowing out 5, 10, 20 years later. Okay. So on behalf of our team, again, my name is Ryan. Thank you for joining us today. Again, Addy, for joining us. Great display of, again, all these exercises. If you have questions, you can reach out to us at fluidhealthandfitness.com um, or reach out by email at admin at fluidhealthandfitness.com. Remember, you can read the blog on the topic. And if you want to go to the condensed version, it's going to be at the very end here. So stick around for that. And remember, your body's designed to move, so stay in motion. We'll see you next time for another episode. See you guys soon. Thank you.